our international master Andrew Martin and welcome to the King's Indian Attack Easily Explained. Another original DVD from the studio of Foxy Opening. The idea of the King's Indian Attack, basically playing a King's Indian Defence with an extra tempo, started to become popular in the 1950s. The King's Indian Defence, that's where Black plays Knight F6 and G6 against the Queen's Pawn, was of course very dominant after World War II, thanks to the efforts of, of masters such as Boleslavsky, Geller, Bronstein and so on. And so masters of course had the bright idea, well why not play this system with an extra move? So it was only in the 1950s really that this opening started to um, attain a degree of popularity. Now there are several ways to get into a King's Indian attack position, but for the purposes of this DVD I'm going to focus on lines where white plays 1e4. And really, I think the King's Indian attack is only effective after 1e4 against the French defence and against the Sicilian defence. It's often used against the Caro Can defence. You can do this, but um, Black has a more comfortable time of it in that system. I'll try to show why. I will show a couple of games in the Caro Can, but I should warn you that there are several effective ways of um, of handling the black side in that opening. But for the time being, let's concentrate on what makes the Kings in an attack an attractive proposition for us. Well, the first thing is that the typical plan of development is easy to understand and play. White is going to set up with knight f3, g3, bishop g2, castles, d3, and then knight bd2. He'll then look to take his position further. And I think well, if I take play on a little bit, we'll get to the basic position against the French defence here, and then we'll have a little discussion of what's happening. All right, well, in the French, um, essentially, White is strong pointing e4 in this particular uh, system. He's not going to play e5 until he's good and ready. He's just securing that pawn. And um, Black normally comes forward on the queen side with c5. There are other methods, and we will examine them a bit later on, but for the time being, let's take the absolutely... Uh, classical situation here where white castles and black does likewise. Alright, well now white must have a very clear idea of how to take this position further. And so to start off with an absolutely classic demonstration of the Kings in an attack in action, a game between Bobby Fischer and the Mongolian master Mieg Marusen. And this game was played in the Susan Interzonal in 1967. You may have seen this game before but it is definitely worth running over again and again because it's a really important game showing most of White's ideas. Well, the King's Indian attack is so named because White is looking to attack Black, basically, on the King side. And he starts to do this with the advance E5. Now, White could prepare that move with Rook E1. But Fisher is obviously not afraid of playing E5 straight away. Black drops his knight back to d7, and now white plays rook e1. Strong pointing the pawn on e5. This pawn really is the linchpin of white's attack. Behind this pawn, white hopes to build his forces up for a successful attack against the black king. Black must not sit there and let it happen, and he usually develops counterplay on the queen side with the help of the move b5. I have seen slower methods adopted, for instance, with moves like b6, but this is a typical club player's mistake. This move is simply too slow. What Black generally finds a bit later on down the line is that he has to play b5 anyway. So masters think that the best way to do it is to play that move straight away. Just dropping back one move. Black can obviously try to train his sights on the uh, pawn at e5 with queen c7. Then I think white would play queen e2. And once again, black has to think about queenside counterplay. This small um, interlude with queen c7 and queen e2 doesn't really change things very much. So Mieg Murison thinks, well, why not start counterplay without delay? OK, now comes another typical move. Knight to f1. b4 getting on with the job. And now h4 by white. Well, the first point of knight f1 is to make the move bishop f4 possible. 
White doesn't necessarily want his queen on e2 in all lines, so if black were to play queen c7, white would simply reply with bishop f4. The second point of knight f1 is to reintroduce that knight into the game via h2, or possibly via e3. After that, the knight could think about coming to the square g4 to aid the king's side attack. So that knight is really not going to stay on f1 for very long. So you can see white is building up his attack slowly but methodically by these means. And black really can't do anything other than just advance on the queen side, which is what Mayag Murison does by playing a5. Now another very nice point of having the rook on e1 in this position is that the classic break in the French f6 is dissuaded. If black were able to play f6 in a position where the rook was on e1, obviously the pawn on e6 would become very weak. So black has to watch out for that pawn all the way along the line if he plays f6. There is another little idea which Fischer plays in this game to restrain f6 a little later on, involving the move bishop h3. And that's another key moment in this game. But for the time being, let's note that f6 is kind of dissuaded. So white continues to build up with a steady move, bishop f4, overprotecting e5 and, um, well, freeing up the f3 knight to a certain extent. I mean, white might think about now moving that knight up to g5 and then, who knows, maybe the queen could come out to h5 and, as you can see, the attack is building up. Seeing no threats, black gets on with the job on the queen side, a4. And now Fisher played a move which was actually revolutionary at the time of this game, um, the quiet little move a3. You wouldn't believe it, but that move is a major contribution to King's Indian attack theory. Formerly, White was just playing a move like knight 1 h2, continuing to build up, allowing black to pay a3. And the problem with this little um, sequence from White's point of view is that he now has weak squares on c3 and d4. All things considered, it's better to prevent black from playing a3 if white can. The black pawn on a3 also sets up certain endgame disadvantages from white's point of view. So Fisher took a very cool look at the position and decided to play a3. And black, I think quite correctly, opens up lines on the queen side by taking on a3. Or well, like knight a5. There are obviously different ways for for black to try to create pressure on the queen side, but there's no obvious target for black to concentrate on there, and white has something of a free hand on the king side, which Fisher uh, intensifies by playing knight to e3. Another good move, I think white could have considered uh, knight 1 to h2 in this position, that's another way of building up the pressure. Probably black was going to play c4 then, and if white blocks with d4, Black comes on with gaining space um, uh, with c3. And then you see Black's got the idea of playing knight to c4, putting pressure on a3. So knight e3, I think, is a more accurate square for the knight. Not a clumsy square at all. d4 by Black is, is rather unattractive. Um, however, Mieg Murison plays this move um, quite soon. And Black is being talked out of playing c4. I think if black plays that move, the long diagonal opens up and then the bishop on g2 would start to become a very strong piece. Note also the knight on e3 could still come to uh, g4 if needed. And also, there's an interesting point here, black plays queen to c7 for instance, then strikes like knight takes d5 become available. That's another very thematic idea in the king's in an attack when you've got a bishop on f4 and black's queen is on c7. That's another trick you can uh, tend to pull. So going back to knight e3, black decided to play bishop a6, trying to get the move a c4 in, and now Fisher played bishop h3. Increasing the pressure, um, a very good move, dissuading black from playing f6, and threatening to increase the pressure further with the help of the move knight g5, when black has to look after a whole complex of squares around his king. d4. Well, you would think, having played knight a5 and bishop a6, that black was going to play c4 in this position. But I suppose after that, white would just shut the queen side down by playing d4. 
And you see now how difficult it is for black to get counterplay. White's attack is far quicker than black. And uh, black cannot block the king side, whereas white seems to have quite effectively shut down black's queen side pressure for the time being. So going back to bishop h3, uh, black changes the nature of the game by playing d4. Knight f1. Now that is um, a move which raised a few eyebrows at the time. And, um, you know, it seems so automatic to play knight g4 in this position. That's so thematic in the king's Indian attack. And it looks more natural. Well, the thing is that I think the reason Fisher played knight f1 in this position, if we just compare the two moves, is that he's leaving the way open for his queen to join the attack via h5. This is a profound idea. Uh, black played knight b6, white played knight g5. And now you have to compare the position with the queen ready to come to h5 with perhaps the position where there would be a white knight on g4 in this position. The knight on f1 can still be introduced into the game. And um, Fisher obviously considered that it was far more effective in this position to get that queen on h5 without delay. All right, that's a judgment call. Black played knight d5. Bishop d2. Well, all right, with the white pieces massing on the king's side, then queen h5 was definitely an interesting move. Um, that seems to be a logical continuation of um, white's plan. And in fact, after h6 only move, white can consider strikes like knight takes f7. Well, I think after that, black had possibly prepared knight takes f4. And um, this is an interesting rejoinder. If g takes f4, rook takes f7, bishop takes e6, black can defend himself with the help of a move like queen e8, with king f8 to come. Moreover, if we go back to knight takes f4, if white decides to throw caution to the winds here, with knight takes h6, g takes h6, and now g takes f4, I think black can get away with the move king g7 in this position. And he defends. So Fisher shows patience, just retreats the bishop to d2, maintains attacking chances, and uh, invites black to find a, a good answer to the coming queen h5. Well, quite naturally, black takes the knight. And white recaptures with the bishop. H takes g5. Well, that would be the type of move you would play with a white knight on g4. If you can imagine the knight on f1 on g4, well, then we're thinking about sacrifices like knight f6 check to open up the black king. But with the knight a long way from g4, Fisher decides to keep things more fluid with bishop takes g5 in the full knowledge that f6 is unplayable. So black's got to find another square for his queen, and he does so with queen d7. Incidentally, one point I just um, should mention here after f takes g5, there is the possibility for white to attack the square h7 in a position of this type. But it takes a long time for him to mass his pieces on the h-file. He would need to play queen h5, 1, king g2, 2. Then he'd have to get his knight out of the way. Knight h2 to g4, that's four moves. Rook comes to h1, and even then he's got to get the bishop out of the way. By that time, black will be able to drop a knight back to f8. I think black, that's black's basic defensive scheme in a position of this type. If he drops a knight back to f8, he can defend that square h7. So, again, another compelling reason why white should take with the bishop. And uh, black play queen d7. Queen comes out to h5. And black prepares for his counterplay with rook fc8. Now, um, it is very difficult to criticise black's moves in this game. I mean, you know, you're playing a very strong opponent. You might feel intimidated. You're trying to do the best you can and find moves which develop counterplay. But possibly um, black should have chosen the move bishop b7 here. And the idea of that is to create some counterplay on the long diagonal. And possibly keep the option of f6 open. 
However, you know, this sort of thing becomes obvious only after the game when the position has been analysed at length. And when you're playing at the board, you've got to make decisions all the time. Rook fc8 looks OK. All right, knight d2. That knight is now heading to the key square e4. Once that knight gets to e4, then, you know, there'll be plenty of very nice options at the knight's disposal. So black puts his knight in on c3 to dissuade white from playing knight e4. And now comes a, a typical king's Indian sacrifice, bishop f6. This is a very nice move, and uh, again, very, very thematic. If black takes the bishop, white can jam up the black king position. Let's see this in action. Let's say uh, black does take this. We take back with the pawn. OK, white's threatening queen g5 check, so black has to play a move like king h8. Then comes knight f3. It's very noticeable in this position how ineffective the black pieces are on the queen side. They're doing absolutely nothing. Well, white's, got, white's threatening knight g5 here, so black has to play rook g8. And now I think knight e5 is just a crushing move. Black has had no time to um, redeploy his pieces for defence, and the knight on e5 has set up a winning fork. So it turns out, going back to bishop f6, black simply can't take that bishop, and he played queen e8, whereupon now white sticks his knight in on e4. OK, g6. Well, of course, black could take the knight straight away. I don't think that would change things very much uh, from the game. White would certainly take back with the rook. And white's threatening to intensify the pressure with rook g4. Something very similar happens in the game as black jabs at the white queen. Queen comes into g5. Um, once again, you know, this is another position where tempting moves are definitely available. You know, how many of us would simply play queen h6 on autopilot there? Well, black can defend himself actually there by queen f8. So, queen g5, again, is a very patient move. White says to black, look, I've got all my pieces in the right area. It's just a question of time. I just need to build up the pressure a little bit more. Well, black takes off the knight. Rook takes. And now pawn up to c4. Well, once again, you know, black does have alternatives. He can try and move like bishop b7 here. Then white would swing his rook across to g4. And black has two ways to try and defend this position. If he goes on to full defence here, with a move like queen f8, then I think white just ploughs through with h5. The only real reason to put the queen on f8 is to make h6 available here. And then after queen f4, queen h4, excuse me, to try and get rid of the white queen by playing g5 but the problem is black is so passive in this position that white has all the time in the world to build up his attack he hasn't even um, he hasn't even got a sacrifice in this position with bishop takes g5 he can just play f4 and if black plays bishop f3 well then we go f takes g5 bishop takes g4 queen takes g4 h takes g5 queen takes g5 check king h7 and now just the simple switch back with bishop g2 wins, because white's threatening bishop e4 check. It really is noticeable how helpless the pieces on the queen side are um, when it comes to defending the black king. So I think the variation after bishop b7 and then queen f8 is pretty clear cut. Let's just go back to rook takes e4 and run that one more time. Bishop b7, rook g4. Now how about queen c6? That move definitely looks tempting, with black threatening checkmate on uh, h1. But then, you know, I just think king h2 is a very effective move. All the squares are covered around the white king. And white is threatening the simple move, queen h6. And I don't see a defence to that move. So going back to the game, this is why the guy plays c4. Well, h5. The time is coming. I mean, that rook now can come into the game by h4 if needed, which is exactly what happens. C takes d3, and now rook h4. And that move sets up um, an immediate threat of pawn takes pawn, followed by rook takes h7. For instance, let's just take a pawn on c2, convince ourselves this is right. Take on g6, rook takes h7. 
I think you'll find that move is completely convincing and leads to mate. So black has no time to realise his material advantage on the queen side. Thus, the Mongolian tries to defend himself by rook a7. He could also try uh, rook c7 in this position, in which case there is another very interesting little combination here from white. Bishop takes e6. I think this is a really good move. If black takes with the queen, queen h6 mate. If he takes with the f pawn in this position, we go h takes g6. Again, what is black to play? I mean, white is just simply trying to strip open his king. If queen takes g6, we go queen takes, h takes, rook h8 check, king f7, rook h7 check, king e8, and now the prosaic move, rook takes c7, which I think you will find wins. So, well actually, you know, white's threat is basically to reintroduce introduce the rook on a1 into the game quite quickly by king g2 and then rook h1. So, black has no time for that either. So he went rook a7 and now Fisher unleashed a famous combination. One that has found its way into the tactical anthologies. He played bishop g2. Mieg Murison took on c2. White went queen h6. Queen f8. And now this superb move, queen takes h7. Um, well, who would not be attracted by that move? The point is that after king takes h7, we take on g6, double check, and then we play this beautiful checkmate with bishop e4. Just going back to the position after bishop g2, let's run that combination once again, because black can possibly defend a little bit better by playing bishop b7. Well, if he does that, we revert to our other idea of taking on g6 and then taking on h7. Again, this wins. And one last little look. Queen h6. If c1 equals queen, trying to deflect the white queen away from the action, we go rook takes c1. Rook takes c1 check. And now the superb move, king h2. There's no need to um, take that rook on c1. White's threat of queen takes h7 and the same checkmate we saw in the game decides. So that was the type of game which um, gave the King's Indian attack a very good name back in the 1960s and suddenly everybody started to play it. Perhaps Black didn't defend himself effectively and optimally in this game but that game gives you a good idea of many thematic ideas in this opening and, um, well, a reason for actually playing this line. It's not that easy for black to beat back the white attack. What I'd like to do now is to bring play into the present day and to demonstrate that actually Fisher's ideas, which we saw in the last game, are still as effective today as they were back in 1967. So my next game is uh, between Grandmaster Basim Amin, um, an Egyptian Grandmaster, a very strong player, who plays the Kings in an attack with great regularity in his games. And he's playing an international master called Sameh Sadek. And this game was played in the Egyptian Championship in 2009. And um, despite the opening being a Sicilian defence, it quickly reverts to um, the French and in fact the exact duplication of the last game up to the point where White played a3. This time of course Amin plays rook e1 not the immediate e5. That's possibly a, um, a slightly more accurate move order as it doesn't necessarily commit White's queen to go to e2. e5 now knight f1 but a5, h4 b4, bishop f4 a4, we saw this in the last game, we discussed it, takes, takes. And now, Sadek, with the benefit of many years' experience, decides to play bishop a6 instead of knight a5. Keep his knight in the centre for action. Who knows, maybe that knight can come into d4 at the right moment and try to break, blunt the white attack. So white played knight e3, the same square that Fisher used 
Um, and perhaps the idea now is after Rook B8, I think this is possibly thought of as the most accurate way to play the black position, the instructive move C4. So this is another move which uh, White must keep in mind when he's got a knight on E3. Okay, what are the points behind this move? Well, first of all, White puts the break on the queen side attack by black. He immediately attacks two black pawns on a4 and d5. This forces black to resolve the position in some way. What black really doesn't want to do is to play the blocking move d4 in this position. This will give white a free hand on the king side. Black would still have to worry about his pawn on, um, on a4. And I imagine white has two effective moves here of the retreats. C2 and F1, I possibly prefer F1 in this position because it keeps more options open. But of course the knight could go to C2. Or White could simply put his knight on G4. Either way, Black's position is unattractive. So Sadek decided to take on C4 and I think that's the right decision. Black has to find counterplay on the queen side in this position or in fact in the centre. And um, he forces White to, to pause. So knight takes C4, White's got to recapture. Alright, knight b6. So this is a much better way for black to try to play this position. He's creating immediate counterplay. White has some weaknesses to look after. He's also got to deal with the threat of uh, capturing on c4. Well, I mean plays knight takes b6. And now rook e3. c4. And it may even look as though black is getting on top in this game. He seems to be impressing himself on white. White seeming to have to deal with his counterplay in the centre before any thought of king, uh, king attack enters white's mind. But Amin presses with knight g5 and um, I think this is a very good move. The point of it is to get the queen on h5 and the bishop on e4 without delay. So when Sadek played h6, white played bishop e4 anyway. C takes D3. Well, black is clearly afraid that after uh, H takes G5, white's going to go Queen H5. Producing an attack, which is very difficult to meet. Obviously, black's got to play G6 in this position, and then there will be no further compromises. Queen takes G6, King H8, and now, well, it's just a question of time, I think, before white gets a rook on the H file. So Sadek just did not like that position. He decided to take on d3. White went queen h5 anyway. And now black played knight d4. Well, he kept the knight on c6 precisely for this reason. But Amina prepared an interesting strike here. He played bishop h7 check. Driving the black king to a slightly less secure, secure square on h8. And now, only now, did white play bishop takes d3. Queen e8. Well, this also introduces a, a mechanism which is quite common in positions of this type. Namely, when there's a white queen on h5 and a black queen comes to e8, black is thinking about the move f5 in this position. White couldn't then take on, on passant because the queen on h5 is on pre. So, white's got to deal with that idea, breaking the, the white attack if the queen's come off. I mean, took on a6 and he played rook d3. After knight b3... White achieved excellent coordination with rook a d1. So despite the fact that black has actually created some counterplay in this position, he's still very much on the defensive. White's attack can continue with moves like rook d7, or possibly knight e4, and then knight f6, or even knight e4, and then bishop takes h6. So Sadik decides to play it safe, or what he thinks is safe, with f5. Getting the queens off the board... But I wonder whether he'd seen White's nice little combination coming up. I mean, played knight f7 check. He played his knight to d6. Well, whatever black does in this position, um, he shouldn't play rook d8. I think this is, was possibly a mistake prompted by time trouble. Black's position is very difficult anyway. You know, White's in full command of, of this position. He's got the open file. He's got better placed pieces. Obviously, if black takes this, um, this knight, white can recapture with the rook. Rooks come off, 
And now Black has some problems in this endgame. He's got some problems with his pawns on e6 and uh, and a4. White is undoubtedly quite a bit better in this position. But rook d8 ran into knight takes f5. A cute double attack which actually wins a pawn. Black's got to take on d3. Knight takes e7 check. And now hey presto, white has emerged uh, a pawn up in this endgame. Of course, it won't be that easy to win. The black knight's quite a flexible piece in this position, and white's bishop is looking at the pawn on e5. But, I mean, makes it look relatively easy in this game. The knight comes to d4, threatening a vicious fork on e2. White gives a check, driving the king back, unfortunately for Sadek. And now bishop e3, knight f3 check. Black even gets the chance to take on e5, but now white plays another very good move here, bishop d4. Knight f7 was played, rook c8 check, possibly this was the move, the idea that black had missed, and now white again goes a pawn up. Okay, the technique in positions of this type is essentially to get a pass pawn, so that will be next on white's agenda. Until white has a passed pawn, he can't really consider this position winning. So let's see how white achieves that aim. Bishop f8. King attacks rook. Rook comes back to c4. And now black can't do very much really apart from march to and fro and wait. So king f3. Okay, well, I imagine white's plan is to run the king up to h5 and then play g4 and then g5. That's the way you would get a passed ball in this position. So black tries to stop him by playing h5. King e3. It's all boiling down to who can improve their position quickest. The problem with black's position is he's tied down completely to this defence of the pawn on a4. So this gives white a free hand, more or less to do as he pleases for the time being. So with rook b5, white tries to tie black down even further. But once again, I, I should stress it's not a winning position until the passed pawn can be created. So f3, all right, keeping the black king out of g4. A rook check, king comes back. Rook g6, bishop e1. And once again, black is tied down to the defence of that pawn on a4. Well, in the game, you know, black makes the decision to jettison the pawn. Um... I think he was basically getting tired of defending this position, but it's getting more and more difficult. Basically, if black goes rook a6, then white can continue with moves like bishop c3, that pawn on uh, e4, e5 is creaking, or maybe even rook a5. This would be an interesting possibility as well, swapping off the rooks. So rook e6... Rook a5, knight d6, rook takes a4, e4, rook a5 check, another good move, driving the black king back. Rook g5 check, driving the black king even more passive, bishop b4. And hey presto, the net effect of all the manoeuvres is that white has his pass pawn on a3. That's the outside pass pawn, which is going to win this game fairly comfortably for white. The knight continues to try to be tricky, but with another pawn. Just dropping off, black decided to play king g8 and resign at the same time. I mean, this is a fairly comfortable win for white after the simple bishop b4. So that was that. But a completely different type of game to the Fisher game that we saw before. The king's in an attack, therefore, is not necessarily um, a system where you can guarantee an assault against the enemy king. It's perhaps misnamed. It's a more sophisticated system than that. I mean, showed in this game just how sophisticated the Kings in the attack was, as he systematically outplayed his opponent. One of the main reasons a lot of players like the Kings in an attack is that um, as you get used to it, it's kind of very methodical. You start to understand the step-by-step -step method which White uses to build up is projected attack against the white king. You get the pawn on e5 and you can then build your pieces behind this pawn and with a good 
knowledge of the typical methods White uses after that, maybe to sacrifice or to demolish the Black King position. You can kind of win games on autopilot. But of course, you know, uh, back in the early days, and we're going to see a, a classic demonstration now, these guys were just making up as they went along, which makes the coming White performance in this game even more admirable. Now, um, this is a very famous game, again, between Mikhail Botvinnik playing White and Wolfgang Ullmann. And this game was played in the Alakai Memorial in Moscow in 1956. So this really was one of the earliest games. But, of course, those sort of games teach us the most. Pioneering efforts and, um, well, fantastic performance coming up by Botvinnik as White plays rookie one. And now, rook b8. This is a move which marks the age of the game, in my view. Uh, nowadays, we know it's it's very important for Black not to waste time with moves like Rook B8 because Rook B8 in the upcoming play doesn't really have any value. It doesn't help Black in any way. So Black had better just get on with the job and play uh, B5. It's worthwhile noting that uh, we'll see a game with D takes E4. D takes E4 doesn't really help the Black cause. It's a move that a lot of club players will play, but it simplifies the position um, in White's favour, in my view. The long diagonal is now a little bit freer, and White has better control of the centre. White is a little bit better in this position. But, Ormond decided to play rook b8. White went e5, now he gets his wedge in the centre, and the characteristic knight f1. Black played b5, h4. So very similar to what we've seen before, except that, I would much rather have a black pawn on b4 in this position than a rook on b8 because I don't understand what that rook is, is doing. All right, bishop a6. Well, I mean, having come this far, once again, I would have kept that bishop on, on c8. I would have just ploughed on with the move b4. One of the main ideas, I think, um, in keeping the bishop on c8 is that black can sometimes give himself the option of playing f6. OK, we know that if black plays f6, then white can take. The rook on e1 comes into the game, possibly bishop h3. White is training his sights on the move e6. But, you know, when you keep the bishop on c8, you can always look out for playing f6. At any rate, I prefer that to bishop a6, which, once again, I'm not sure what it's achieving. I mean, we can see what Allman's up to. White played knight h2, black plays b4. He's opening up the bishop, and he's hoping to create some counterplay against the centre, but... It's going to take a long time. What is Black planning in this position? Is he playing bishop b5? He runs the black pawn all the way up to a4, then he plays b3. Is he trying to undermine white's queen side by those means? Well, maybe he is, but that takes a long time. And white uses this time to build up in the systematic way with bishop f4. And now another interesting move here, bishop h3. Same sort of move that Fisher used. Restraint against the F-pawn for one thing. Knight G5 is the other item on the agenda. Queen H5 to follow. And then we know that that's getting softened up. Bishop H3. Where, where, where as you could say, most of the moves that White has played could be played by virtually anybody. Bishop H3 three is a far more sophisticated move than the ones we've seen so far. So it's well worth... Uh, bearing this move in mind. Always watch out for bishop h3. Slightly paradoxical move. You normally think, I've got my bishop on g2, I'm going to keep it there. But bishop h3 has a number of interesting ideas behind it. Well, black played c4. Again, a5 was a very real alternative there. And just try and get something going on the queen side with a4 and b3. But c4 by Allman. And now, correctly, Botvinnik blocked with d4. Black played queen b6. Bishop comes back to e3. And now rook fc8. So black is trying to get some some ideas going on the queen side. Okay, knight g5. Well, we've seen this move before. And queen h5 is, is coming next. Black tries to defend deeply by playing knight f8. But white played f4. Now that h7 is securely protected, he doesn't see the need to play queen h5 just yet. And Ormond dropped back with knight d8. So he's going to try and make it as difficult as possible to um, to batter him to death on the king side. 
F5. Well, what Vinnick mentioned the move knight g4 alternative. Let's see those moves. Knight g4. Possibly g4. But in the end, he decided to go with the move f5. Black took, as he probably should. I mean, that at least frees up the queen along the third rank for defence. Bishop takes f5. And now Ormond put his knight on e6. Whereupon white played queen f3. And so certainly there are threats now to f7. So Ormond takes the knight. H takes. And now what we're going to see is the twin effect of the white pawns on e5 and g5 has a very serious impact on this position. White's immediate first idea is to play his knight into f6. You'll remember bishop f6 that Fischer played against Mieg Murison. This is the same type of idea. A piece sack to jam up the black king. Well, rook d8 was played. Knight g4. Black played knight g6. And now king g2. The secondary effect of having a pawn on g5, it really cramps that pawn on h7. So white is just simply threatening to build up on the h-file now. Rook h1, possibly rook h2, and then rook a h1. Allman hastens to get some pieces off the board, but this doesn't really stop the white attack. What well, Benning's happy to take that, bishop, and then play rook h1. Queen a e6, and now the rook comes to h5. Rook b6, rook a h1, and now here's the move black was relying on all along, knight f8. But now comes another one of those key moves that you have to really master if you're going to play the kings in an attack with any frequency and you shouldn't be afraid of the killer knight f6 check. Well, black's got to take that knight. If he doesn't take, rook takes h7 check will force mate. So, he did take. White smashed open lines with g takes f6. And now Allman played the forced move, bishop takes f6. What he's hoping is that after e takes f6 as played, he can get, get into some sort of ending here with queen e4. But this doesn't save him. After queen takes e4, d takes e4, rook g5 check, black is still in terrible trouble. He played knight g6 to defend himself. Rook came across to c5. Well, again, I think Black's move is completely forced. He's got to take the pawn on f6. Rook c8 check. You can see the problem. If king g7, bishop h6 is mate. So knight f8 is absolutely forced. And now the lovely move, rook h4. This is very good. The black pawns are very weak. It's kind of like creating two weaknesses in an endgame. You know... The idea in chess, you know, you can, you've got the advantage, you're ganging up on one weakness, in this case the black king, but that might not be enough to win the game. So White emphasises how much better he is in the position by focusing on black's second weakness, which is basically his pawn structure. The twin defensive responsibilities of trying to protect his king and defending his pawns send black over the top in this position. So after king g7, rook takes e4, rook a6, it was time to pick off a few pawns with rook takes c4. Black play rook b7. Obviously, if black takes on a2 in this position, then white takes on b4. And white is a, a safe pawn up. Black's king is still weak and very vulnerable to strikes from the white bishop. So rook b7 was played. Up comes the passed pawn. Doesn't stop white from taking on b4 anyway. Rook takes b2. Possibly a mistake prompted by time trouble. Bishop d4 check. Concluding the, um, the game. And uh, black resigned. Now just dropping back. Obviously black doesn't have to play rook takes b2. He can struggle on with a, a move like rook takes b4. And then some move like knight d7. But really this position is completely hopeless. I mean one of the easiest ways white can win this is just to push his ball. And uh, two passed pawns combined with a bishop will win this game easily. So 
again a pioneering effort. White started off by building up in a thematic way. He translated his advantage into something concrete with the sacrifice on F6. This one material, and uh, well, it concluded with a very easy technical position for Bob Finnick. So very good play by um, White, and uh, another very instructive effort. We saw a little earlier how uh, Bobby Fischer was able to use the King's Indian attack very successfully in his game against Miag Murison. He also used the same motifs with the black pieces. So I don't think it's out of place, despite the fact I'm recommending the King's Indian attack for White, to see a splendid Fischer performance as black in the King's Indian attack. Because um, the way he plays it, to a degree, mirrors our approach with White. And... Um, I think you should imagine in this game, um, playing white is Emil Nikolic, playing black Bobby Fischer, played in Vinkovsky in 1968. You can imagine that the same motifs are applying in this game uh, as to, for instance, white playing 1e4, black playing c5 in the Sicilian. It's just a reverse Kings in an attack against a Sicilian defence. As it turns out, Bobby Fischer manages to prove that the extra tempo that white has in these positions doesn't make a great deal of difference. Now, the first difference is felt here in that Black has not yet developed his knight on um, b8. So I suppose if White wanted to, he could take on e5 in this position and then take on d8. This, of course, is a very toothless approach, and especially so here, with the diagonal of the bishop on g2 blunted by the pawn on c6, and no real... Um, no real opportunity for White to get anything other than a draw from this position. I mean, I suppose the best move here really is something like Rook D1. But, um, you know, Black can, Black can play on here. And I'm sure that Fisher would have done with something like Rook takes D1 and then Bishop E6. OK, you know, if as Black the opponent does something like this, you can't do very much about it. But um, in general, most players are up for a fight with the White pieces, as they should be. And in this particular game, Nikolic just played Rook B1. So, with hindsight, we know this is a wasted move in many ways. It's similar to Allman's Rook B8 in the last game. White should simply content himself with getting on with, um, getting on with the queenside attack with moves like B4. Rook B1 doesn't really have much part to play in the uh, coming moves. Fisher played E4, B4, and now Bishop F5. So, you can see the similarities with the uh, Kings in an attack. And they continue as white plays h3 and black plays h5. Black, well, if you imagine white would normally play h4 uh, anyway, but in this case black plays h5 specifically to stop white from playing g4 and then knight g3, ganging up on the pawn at e4. White played knight f4 and black played knight bd7. So this is a very similar type of position to the one we're angling for as white. And black's intentions are twofold. Number one, he's aiming to get a kingside attack. And number two, he's aiming to defend himself successfully against White's projected attack on the queen side. Fisher dropped his knight back to f8. You can see how similar this must be. c5, d5. Now, um, I'm absolutely convinced that c5 was a mistake. Because once again, White is blocking the queen side. We've seen the perils of this uh, from Black's perspective in the preceding games. Now we see White making the same error here. Yes, Nikolic thinks, OK, I can press forward with B5. But taking all the tension out of the central pawn structure makes Black's centre rock solid and much easier for him to, to manage the king's side attack. Because White doesn't really have much counterplay. I mean, OK, he takes on C6. But how easy is it for White to, to get after that pawn? Now that he's played A4, he can't even play Queen A4 to follow up. So just dropping back to the position after knight f8, I do feel that white would have had better chances for success if he pressed forward with b5 and then just continued, uh, or even maybe a5, and just continued to try and um, create some pressure on the queen side by these means. However, Nikolic played c5, d5, b5, and now knight 8 to h7. So the knight is heading for g5, I think to cause white fresh problems. Well, bishop d2 is, is symptomatic of white's difficulties here. Um, white has no really active plan. He can pretend he's doing something on the queen side, but what does it actually amount to? 
Meanwhile, Black manoeuvres his pieces into better positions and starts to put the heat on. Rook comes to b2, Queen comes up to d7, and now White has to think about the pawn on h3. He certainly doesn't want to play h4 in this position. Black would be delighted with that, because that would give him the opportunity a bit later to either think about g5, or maybe to even sacrifice a piece on h4. So Nikolic plays the less committal move, king h2, and we can't blame him for doing that. And now comes a very good move indeed, bishop h6. Two ideas behind this key move. Point number one, at some stage, Black may be thinking of taking off that knight with the bishop. That will remove a key defender of the white king. OK, he's got to move his knight on g5 out of the way first, but that's certainly very much on Black's mind. The second idea, and I think this is the more important one, uh, Black is planning king g7 and then rook h8. King up, rook across. I think that's the primary idea behind bishop h6. Well, white plays a5, again pretending he's doing something, and now comes a splendid move by Fisher, bishop g4. A thematic sacrifice once again, and I'm sure this was a move Nikolic overlooked. Probably white's got to take that piece in view of the big weakness here on f3. So h takes g4, h takes g4. Now the idea of king g7 and rook h8 becomes very appropriate, as does Knight f3 check. White went rook h1. Black put the knight in on f3. Um, of course, white has to take that. And now black takes back with the g-pawn. Well, this is this is really problematic for, for white now. He cannot shove shunt his pieces across to the king side to help his king. It's noticeable that the queen side pieces once again are completely almost move bound in this position and helpless to prevent Black's coming attack. Well, White played King G1, and now uh, Black played it very simply. He took on F4. Obviously, Black uh, Black is threatening Queen G4 if he takes with the G pawn, so he must take with the E pawn. King G7, F5, Rook H8. Key idea of attacking play is not to waste any time. Black's idea here is just to strip out the defenders of White's king and then go in with queen h3 and then queen g2 mate. What really can white do here? Black simply threatening a slow motion mate, starting with queen takes f5. Nicholas decided to jettison a piece with bishop h6 check. Now let's just take a look at the alternative here, rook takes h8. Okay, uh, black recaptures, rook takes h8. And now what is white to do? I mean he really is in a hopeless situation. If he tries queen f1, we go queen takes f5. And now black is threatening queen h5. Going back to rook takes h8, rook takes h8. There's no escape for the white king here with king f1, rook h1 is mate. And so I think we can conclude that uh, basically white is lost. Bishop h6 tries to clear the decks at the cost of a piece. And, well, a feeble attempt to get the queen in really with queen d2. But Fisher just simply plays g5. B takes c6 was answered by queen takes f5. Very well calculated by black, as in the Mirosen game, um, the attacker just jettisons the queen side. He knows he's putting the boot in there against the white king. Last throw of the dice here. Knight comes to e3 to defend against the mate. And now king g6. I suppose black can also play knight g4 in this position. That's also uh, very, very strong. But king g6 will do the job threatening rook h8. White resigned. So a game with black perhaps, but a very typical king's in an attack, um, and uh, very well played by Bobby Fischer. I suppose the, the key move there was bishop g4, sacrificing that piece. Let's go back to that moment. Well, you're going to encounter very similar motifs when you play 1e4 and black plays c5, and you get to your king's Indian attack position. More of that a little later. One of the biggest dangers to White in the King's Indian attack is that he can become like some sort of automaton, just playing the normal moves, reeling them out, without actually giving thought to specific circumstances in the position. 
I've seen this happen many times, and especially among club players. They get so used to playing the same old moves time after time after time, trotting out the normal Kings in an attack, that they don't pay attention to details in the position. In the French defence, and in other systems in fact, against the Kings in an attack, Black has some specific ideas where White has to deviate from the normal routine. And perhaps one of the most important is in the position after knight gf3, where Black plays the unusual move, bishop c5. This is actually quite a tricky system, and White must play completely differently to the normal Kings in the attack against it. Basically, what Black is hoping for is White is going to play the very naive move here, g3. After that, Black is immediately better in the position after d takes e4. White has serious problems. If he takes back with the d-pawn, Black plays knight g4, targeting f2. There's no real uh, good way for White to defend it. And after g3, d takes e4. If White takes back with the knight, well then again it's simple. Black takes off the knight, takes off the queen, and then takes on f2. Forewarned is forearmed. But the general point that White just can't play the same old thing against everything in the Kings in the attack is a very important one, and you should note it. At no time when you play this opening must you fall into the trap of stereotype thinking. So we come to the game Larino Nieto, who's a strong Spanish player. And uh, this game, he was white against Luis Leon Varela. And this game was played in the Canaries Open Tournament in uh, July 2010. And uh, White played a much better move now. He played e5. If there is a drawback to the black system, it must be that black is putting his minor pieces on exposed squares. So White takes immediate advantage of this by playing e5, driving the knight back. I mean, I don't think there's any future in knight g4 in this position. White would simply play d4. So he hits the knight, drives it back, and now he attacks the bishop. Well, black doesn't really want to be uh, seeding that bishop at this point in the game, so it's a question of where he puts it. Leon Varela decides to put it on b6. I suppose black could play his bishop back to e7, and white would probably play uh, d4 there. Black plays c5, white plays c3. And now we get a kind of typical uh, French defence situation, almost a Tarash variation, but um, it seems to me that white's had an extra move. White would perhaps further his advantage in this position, his slight advantage, admittedly, by playing a move like h4. Something like this happens in the game. White expands on the king side, gaining space, and gives himself attacking opportunities. All this is relatively uncharted territory. However, it is a rather significant departure from the norm. Well, in this game, the black player plays bishop b6, and white plays h4. c5 was answered by c4, so this is yet another way to play the position. Two things strike me. One, how poor the bishop looks on b6 blocked in by his own pawn on c5, and how remote that bishop is from the king's side. So it makes sense for white to play a move like h4, gaining space. Perhaps white's thinking about jamming that pawn all the way up to h6 to create dark square weaknesses. However, knight c6 was played, bishop f4. There's no real target on the king side just yet, so white can tense himself with development. Black, as usual, makes the e5 pawn something of a target, and in order to defend that pawn, white's got to play queen e2. So when white plays like this, he's got to have been thinking about an alternative location for the bishop on f1. Black continued trying to disrupt white's plans by playing bishop a5 check, and White was happy to remove that bishop. Queen takes a5. Bishop drops back to d2. Queen c7. And now White takes on d5. Of course, as now White has inherited the bishop here, it makes sense to open up the game. E takes d5. Well, I suppose um, there were other moves for, for Black in this position. But the fact is, Knight c takes e5 looks rather unattractive in view of the simple d takes e6. I don't like the fact that position's opening up and white's bishop pair could play a very key role. Um, however black plays in this position, I think he's going to find himself at the mercy of the bishop pair. For instance, if he takes on e6 with the pawn, we can play bishop c3. 
takes on f3, queen takes f3. Aside from anything else, black's pawn structure is rather ragged and uh, he's got some problems with his pawn on g7. So that's why in the game black takes back on d5 with the pawn. d4, another interesting move. Again, opening up the position for the bishop pair. I suppose white was thinking, well, I'm going to play e6 in a minute. Let me create some opportunities for my bishop on f1. And black decides to play safe and castle. Well, black could take a risk in this position. Let's say he takes with the knight on d4. Um, I think white would probably take that and then go e6. Again, a very unclear position, but uh, the extra pawn that black has here isn't going to last very long. And um, you have to say that white's prospects of opening up the game for his dark square bishop are very real here. And there's also rook c1 coming into the mix. So black probably felt that his development was so retarded in this position, he couldn't possibly risk it. He had to get his king out of the middle. Thus, he castles. White consistently opens up with d takes c5. But you see, this is about as far removed from a normal king's in an attack as can be. Knight d takes e5. White castles on the queen side. A very sharp move. Bishop f5 was answered by knight takes e5, knight takes e5, and now bishop c3. In all stages in a chess game, you have to take a look around the position, and you have to determine what are the imbalances. The clear imbalance in this position is A, the presence of a bishop pair for white, and B, the fact that white's pawn structure is slightly better than black. Black must try to compensate for those weaknesses by activity. That's the only way he's ever going to get anything out of this position. So rook fe8 is natural, maintaining the knight in the middle and uh, setting up veiled threats to the white queen. So the white queen moves. Knight comes to c6, bishop d3. So with this move, um, white renounces the idea of playing with the bishop pair. Instead, he tries to target the weaknesses in black's position. All right, d4. Bishop comes back to d2. Queen takes f2, and play now takes on a forced character, as white plays rook hf1, forcing a trade on d3, and now black plays queen e2, angling for the endgame. Well, obviously, black could again play queen takes g2 in this position. Uh, he obviously doesn't do this, because he feels that would open up lines towards his own king. So instead he goes queen e2, and white plays queen b3, targeting f7. Queen comes back to e6. Queen takes on b7. And after rook a b8, white played queen c7. Queen e4 check was answered by king a1. And now black played rook e7 to cover f7. Whereupon white now played queen f4. Around here, white is quite happy to have the queens off because he's re-established material equality and has a queen side poor majority in the endgame. There's no real way the black can get at the white king if the queen's come off the board. So Leon moves in with queen c2, threatening mate. And now white plays a very clever move, which I'm sure he's seen in advance. Bishop c3. Very tactical, very clever, and based on the bat rank trick. D takes c3. Queen takes b8 check. Knight takes b8. Rook d8 check. And mate next move. So, queen e4. Queen takes e4, rook takes e4, bishop d2, rook takes h4, and now a3. Rook comes to e4, white puts his rook in on f5, and black gets in behind the passed pawn with rook d8. And now white starts to use his queenside pawn majority. Black plays a6 to hold things up. White brings his king back into the centre. f6, rook e1, the rooks come off. Rook e8, bishop d2, rook comes down to e2, and black now goes two pawns up. a4, I have no doubt at all these last moves were played against the background of time trouble, because now comes a very interesting move here. Rook takes e5, f takes e5, and now c6. Remarkably, black is helpless to prevent the advance of the passed pawns. Imagine facing this position when you have no time. Leon played rook g6, white went b5, 
the pawns came off, and incredibly, Black cannot stop the c-pawn in time. He played king f7, c7, Black resigned. Just going back to the position after a takes b5, Black had tried to bring his rook back into the fray with rook e6, c7, and then rook e8. But b6 will do the job. Now that was um, quite an unstereotyped game all the way through. In the end, the better player won because he was able to orientate himself in this unfamiliar situation better than his opponent. I'm not actually sure what the objective merit of the position was like after a move like rook takes h4 if we return to this moment. Obviously white will always have the prospect of pushing those queenside pawns up the board, but you have to say, with best play, it's not clear that black should lose this. However, there can be no doubt, going right back to the opening, that white's correct approach is to start pushing black around. At any rate, against this tricky line, he should not play g3 right away. We move to another game of Bobby Fischer now. His games in the Kings in an attack were always uncommonly instructive. And um, this is a game he, he played against the Yugoslav Grandmaster Borislav Ifkov in the Piatigorsky Cup in 1966. And it features a line which could arise from both the Sicilian move order and the French move order as Fischer starts to set up his uh, position with g3. Black plays d5, knight bd2 and now bishop d6 and then knight g e7. This is a very tough nut to crack. This is the Karpov system. Um, Black sets up a position of harmonious development and uh, he's intending to castle on the king side and then think about just developing his queen side in a very routine manner with either b6 and bishop a6 or bishop b7 or maybe even bishop d7. White cannot hope for too much against this system but the way Fisher plays it is quite interesting as after both sides castle he plays the move knight h4. This accomplishes two things. Number one, it opens up fire from the bishop on g2 against the centre and number two and this is the most important aspect of the position in my view it gives white the possibility of playing f4 this is the key idea behind knight h4 and in this game it's black who falls into the trap of playing in a stereotype way as Ivkov just settles for the normal move here let's say b6 now Black has other moves in this position. I'm not saying that White can achieve a clear advantage against all these moves, but White does have a nice easy plan. He's going through with the move f4 more or less come what may. After the game, going back to knight h4, Ifkov suggested d takes e4. And after d takes e4, knight g6. Okay, I slightly prefer White here after knight takes g6 and then knight c4. Once again, it's a rather different form of the King's Indian attack to the one that we're used to. White must play positionally here, aiming to exploit his slight advantage of the better pawn structure. Although it won't be easy, Black's position is quite difficult to crack. However, in this position, White does have a small edge. Let's just see what happens in the game, though, after b6, as White goes with f4. Black takes on e4, and then plays the tempting move, bishop a6. Well, you could see this could be very attractive, even to a grandmaster as strong as Ifkov. Uh, of course, at the time this game was played, in 1966, Ifkov was one of the strongest players in the world. Black gets his bishop out, he attacks the rook, he forces what he thinks is a small concession, and um, gets on with the game, as it were. But there's no doubt about it, White now has the advantage, because of his presence in the centre. Well, Ifkov plays c4, and the point of this, I think, is to try to maybe even sack a pawn with c3 to mess up the white queen side. After that, black could proceed with moves like rook c8 and have some clear targets to aim at. So Fisher shuts that down with c3. And now black plays his knight to a5. This looks like it might be a mistake in view of e5, but black's got it all under control. He plays his bishop to c5, check, and then he plays his knight into d5, blocking the diagonal. Well, Again, Black has alternatives here. He could move his rook. That would appeal to a lot of players, just simply getting another piece into the game. 
Against that, Fisher was planning the interesting move B4. Black's got to take that. White recaptures with the pawn. And now the black minor pieces on the queen side, far from in a, being in attacking positions, look like they're set up to be attacked themselves by White's B pawn. I think this continuation would leave uh, Black in serious trouble. So that's why, going back to the game, if Goff plays knight to d5, and now White puts his knight up on e4. So there are certain ideas in the Kings in the attack which um, are even common in this position. The first of these is that White's got a pawn on e5. Behind this pawn, he's hoping to build up the attack. That is a very standard KIA motif. And even here, when the pawns are slightly blocked in the centre, that pawn on e5 is very difficult for Black to shift. And Fisher uses the pawn, in fact, to build a very big attack. As after bishop b7, he moves in with queen h5. Well, you know, White had other ways to play this position. Even a player as strong as Fisher um, must be tempted to have taken that bishop. There's no doubt about it. Knight takes c5, uh, b takes c5 would have given White a substantial advantage here. But Black has some chances, certainly due to the strength of his knight on d5. So Fisher just decides to leave that bishop on the board. I mean, what is that bishop doing, actually, to white? And puts his queen out on h5 with ideas of knight g5 coming up. So knight e7, perhaps this was the moment, actually, for queen e8. We've seen this idea before. Um, Black's intending to get rid of the queen by going f5. However, there can be no doubt, once again, with knight takes c5 available, that white is better. But in the game, if Ifkov dropped back, with knight e7, and now white plays g4, going on to the full attack against the black king. g4, of course, cuts the knight out from coming to f5, should that move have ever been needed to be used. Bishop takes e4, bishop takes e4, g6, and now Fisher puts his queen in on h6. This looks very serious for black as white is now threatening simply knight f3 and then knight g5. Knight d5 was played. Well, black can put his king in, uh, on h8 in this position. Knight comes to f3 and maybe try and defend the, the game out by playing his knight to g8. Well, against that, white would drop his queen back to h3 with full control of the position. Not only is the rook on a8 now on pre, White is threatening moves like f5, knight g5, and black has no counterplay. That is a problem with this position from black's point of view. His pieces are strewn out all over the board, and he hasn't got anything to do. So if Goff, in the game, plays his knight back to d5, and white goes through with f5. From a certain point on, if Goff plays like a man who hasn't got anything to do. The threat is f6. Black must play rook e8 in order to vacate the f square, f8 square for the bishop. Fisher correctly strips open lines, and then he moves in with knight takes g6. This really is very simple fair. If h takes g6, queen takes g6, check. King f8, obviously if king h8, queen h7, mate. And now rook f1, check. Just uh, completes the demolition job. So after knight takes g6, black played queen d7. But now, of course, it's a different, um, a different type of game. Fisher's quite happy to drop back to f4. And swap off. And black played rook a d8. Well, Ifkov around these parts must have known he was lost. He's a pawn down against an attacking genius. And his king is wide open. He could, of course, have taken that knight. And then put his rook on d8. Well, then once again, it's very simple. We go rook a d1. And uh, again, Ifkov would love to play queen takes d1 here. But it's not possible because uh, white plays the intermet. So queen takes h7 check. Followed by bishop h6. So queen g7, and now rook takes d8. Bishop takes h7, check. Very nice, and now queen g5, check. That's the simplest way to win. Forking the black king and rook. So rook a d8, knight h5. Again, uh, very simple ideas. Bishop g5 is in the mix, knight f6, check is in the mix. Black cannot possibly defend this position. Knight f6 was played. Black takes it. Understandable. If he puts his queen on g7 in this position, then white reverts to very simple fair. He takes off the rook, takes off the queen, and then plays bishop g5. 
Black has no compensation whatsoever uh, for his missing exchange and, in fact, a pawn. So knight takes f6, e takes f6, rook g8, bishop f4, rook takes g4, rook a d1, neat deflection. Rook g8, I mean the queen was overloaded there, couldn't possibly protect the rook on d8 and defend against mate on h7. And now this beautiful move f7. An interference theme concludes if Koff resigns. If queen takes f7, we go bishop e5, check, and now the cute move, queen takes h7. Is that a kind of smothered mate? I'm not sure what to call that mate. I suppose it is a kind of smothered mate in a way, but a very attractive finish. My conclusion is that, going back to position after castles, it's very difficult to break the Karpov system down. But when you get here, White's best bet is knight h4. I'm covering that bishop on g2 and planning to grab space in the centre with f4. With this move, White should keep a slight edge. Passive or planless play from black against the Kings in an attack is quite often fatal and can lead to some attractive attacking possibilities for White. I'm going to show you a game now from the Mondaris Zonal Tournament in 2000 between Grandmaster Vladimir Chuchilov and Ennio Arlandi, who's a strong player, graded 2 4 3 5. Yet in this game, he seems completely out of form or ill at ease playing against the Kings in an attack, let's say. White starts off with knight f3. That's not our recommended move order um, because I'll tell you why. I don't like the possibility of black playing d5 here and then bishop g4. I think this is a possibility white should avoid and there's also bishop f5. A final move which I'm not sure I like from white's perspective is c6. I think all these moves lead to a comfortable position for black. However in this game Arlandi seems content to go back into the French defence and so white is quite happy to set up the normal kings in an attack position with e4. But now comes b6. This move is okay, but not necessarily connected with casting on the king side. Tuchelov plays c3, and now black thinks to himself, okay, white doesn't normally play this in the king's in an attack. I can see that there's a slight weakness on d3 now that I can exploit, and so he decides to castle short. We'll see a bit later that perhaps black would do better in this, this position to try to angle the castle on the queen side. Perhaps with the help of moves such as queen c7, followed by a move like h6, followed by castles, and then maybe an attack against the white king on the king side. That has happened in many games, and we'll see how this all works out a little later on. However, white has played this rather cunningly. I think against a move like queen c7, he's going a3. And um, once again, black has to make a tricky decision of where to put his king. Well, that's in the future. Let's rejoin this game now with black castling short. And now comes the standard idea, putting the pawn on e5 and playing the knight back to f1. So the only differences here between this and the main line are that white has played c3 and that black has played b6. However, I don't like this variation with b6. I think it gives white far too easy a time of it on the king side and Chuchilov builds up in the standard fashion by playing h4 and then bishop f4. Knight comes to b6. And now knight comes to g5. So this is a standard move. Queen h5 is coming into the mix. And um, it's hard to see black counterplay on the queen side. At this point, normally black would have some pawn on b4 or maybe the pawn on a4 and then coming to a3. Black's a long way off from creating targets on the queen side. So he's got to sit and defend his king side which uh, is a most unattractive prospect. Now after knight g5, um, the point of this move is that if black goes h6, white's going to go queen h5 anyway. h takes g5, h takes g5. This is a very standard, um, standard plan. White's idea, well white's going to manoeuvre a knight to g4, either via h2 or e3, He's going to move his bishop out of the way. He's going to move his king up to g2. And he's going to play rook h1. This might seem very long-winded. But there's very little black can do about it. That is the problem with these positions. 
Black can't free himself because he can't break out with F6. That would be the normal breakout move because White just simply goes G6. Therefore, without this possibility, despite the fact that that plan by White takes an awful long time, Black can't do anything about it. So I would say this is a very standard King's Indian attack position. Let me get rid of some of these arrows because uh, the point has been made about the attack. Watch out for the twin effect of the pawns on e5 and g5. They really do render the black position almost hopeless. So, knight g5. Already black's position is becoming critical. And Arlandi plays queen e8. And um, once again, his idea is that after queen h5, he's going to take the, the knight now. This is a different um, idea. And now he's going to go f5. That is the point. Whether those queens come off or not... Black's king will be safe. And then I think Black can turn his attention to White queenside. So, queen comes to e8. White's got to find a different way of prosecuting his attack. To start with, Chuchilov brings the knight to g4. Bishop a6. Well, perhaps if Black had anticipated what was coming, he would have played a move like king h8. Parking his king in the corner out of harm's way for the time being. But there's no doubt about it, White is a very promising uh, position here. He's massing his pieces on the king side, and um, the black king side looks rather fragile. Perhaps White could consider a move like h5 in this position straight away, or maybe queen to d2. Bishop a6, however, whilst tempting, leads to a typical sacrifice here, knight f6 check. Crushing move. Black has to take this knight. And now comes queen h5. Of course white can get away with this sacrifice because the bishop on f6 blocks the f-pawn. So white can't, uh, black can't exchange the queens. And look at all these pieces on the queen side. Unable to participate in the defence. So yes, white's a piece down. But on the king side, he's masses of material ahead in dynamic terms. The first point of this queen move, well, black can't take the knight. He gets mated, I think. Queen f6 check, and then bishop h6. This is basic, standard, and winning. After queen h5, what else is there? He tried h6. Queen takes h6, and now takes on g5. But this doesn't change things. Queen takes on g5, check. Queen h5, check. And now bishop h6. Again, this leads to mate. Black could push his f-pawn. If he tries f6, we go queen g4, followed by mate. If he tries f5, we go queen g5 check, also followed by mate. So after bishop h6, our landy resigned. And what's noticeable in, in this game, of course, is that Black didn't, didn't get to fire a shot in anger on the queen side. So the logical conclusion must be that Black must play energetically, on the queen side against the kings in the attack in the French. He must proceed there without delay and create some targets. Or the same fate that befell Arlandi in this game awaits. My, my next game features uh, quite a popular defensive system for black. Um, it's the one where black plays b6 and keeps his king position flexible for the time being in the centre. Now, to illustrate this system, I've chosen a game from the Minsk Open, played in August 2010, between Vitaly Tetarev, whose grade is 2520, and Alexander Bakin. I've taken slight liberty with the move order, because in fact, White played knight f3 in the game, but we can quickly transpose to uh, our featured system via the French move order. Knight d2, knight f6, and now g3, b6, bishop g2, bishop b7, knight g f3, and hey presto, we've got our uh, counter fianchetto. Now one can see the attractions of this system for black. Black tries to neutralise the bishop along the long diagonal. He puts a certain degree of pressure on e4, and I'll show you what happens if black takes on e4 right away in a moment. And, um, well, he can castle on either side. There are definite attractions to this setup, and it is popular, so you must be prepared to meet it. Now, in the game, um, well, we'll transpose to the game. Let's imagine Black played Bishop e7. He could, of course, take on e4. One can see this type of position occurring time and again in this system, and against it, White will play knight g5. 
The point is that the pawn on e4 is now pinned against the unprotected bishop on b7. And, well, in general, black can only uh, inherit really a slight disadvantage in this position uh, after a capture like d takes e4. And the point is that white has extra control of the centre. The pawn on e4 gives him slightly the better position. Nothing more than that, but it is a slight edge to white. So that's why most black players generally prefer to uh, take the centre with a move like c5. Again, if we just drop back, black can consider the move d takes e4, knight g5, but it's going to reach uh, the same type of position as last time. h6 we take with the knight, knight takes. Knight, pawn takes gives white a slight edge. Knight takes is also possible in this position, threatening knight f6 check. In general, black avoids this type of position because he doesn't have any definite means of counterplay. So after rook e1, knight c6 will reach the main line of this, this counter fianchetto variation, if you like. And now I'm recommending that white deviate from the norm by playing c3. You see, you've got to anticipate the idea of black castling queenside in this position. In fact, if we just take play on a little bit further, just one move in fact, where black plays queen c7, this is the main line. Black could easily cast on either side, and you have to adapt. What you don't want to do necessarily is to go rushing in with moves like e5 and h4, especially when the black king is in the middle. It's a fact that the move h4 can sometimes work against you in this position, because another part of black's plan is perhaps to wait one more move with h6, and then if you castle, if you play h4 too early and he manages to cast on the queen side, he can maybe hit you with a quick g5. So that's why we play if we just drop back by move c3. It's a very flexible idea. If black is going to cast on the queen side, we're going to hit him maybe with the idea of a3 and b4, or b4 at some moment. Meanwhile, if he, for instance, uh, hangs around in the middle for a while, maybe with h6, well, after h6, we can play a3, and the game continues. In the game, Tetsuroff played knight f1. I like that move. I think it's the wrong moment to go rushing in with e5, as after knight d7, the pawn on e5 is on pre uh, three times. If white goes d4, we take, take, and then knight b4 already shows a good reason why, why white has played e5 too early. The square is d3, and c2 are chronically weak. So this is definitely a position for white to avoid. So Tetareff, going back to the game, plays knight f1, and now black decides to Change the nature of the game, I think, by playing d takes e4. My guess is that um, black was a little bit worried about castling queenside in this position, and possibly with a good reason after bishop f4, white's best move after castles. And now in the game Loginoff versus Kosarev St. Petersburg 2003, because this position has been repeated many times, black played queen d7 and white played queen a4. Black played h6. And white played h4, and black played rook dg8. So it's absolutely clear what black is, black is up to. Then came b4. And now I think black is starting to feel the heat a bit. If he opens up lines by taking the pawn on b4, his king is, well, under serious pressure. So black decided to play knight g4, concentrating on counterplay himself. And now Loginoff played very accurately. He took on d5. He played b5, and then he played bishop h3, pinning that knight. Very awkward for uh, black. After f5, bishop takes g4, and then knight e5, white was playing powerful chess. Knight g6, queen g6, and then rook takes e7, confirmed white's obvious advantage. So that's the type of mess, and of course white went on to win this game. That's the type of mess black can get into in this system if, if white keeps it flexible, and, of course, he managed to use the move c3 in a positive way. So going back to the game, Tetareff versus Bakin. Black takes on e4, white recaptures. And now again, black's got a slight decision to make, really. In the game, he played the natural castles. Rook d8 has been played a few times. I'm not sure this changes the nature of the position very much, as we're going to reach, uh, we're going to reach something like this in the game. White plays queen e2, and again, has slightly the better of things due to his extra central pawn. I should stress, however, that it's not much, because black hasn't done anything wrong. White's position is just slightly more compact, and, well, as black's going to cast on the king side, white does have some attacking chances in the normal King's Indian manner. The pawn will go to h5, 
and so on. So, castles by black in the game, e5, rook fd8, queen e2, you can see the similarity now, and black decides to play knight d5. Well, I doubt this is a position for knight d7. I mean, the problem with knight d7 is that is entirely passive. White goes h4, and then he will definitely have some sort of an attack coming. No doubt that knight on d7 is going to drop back to f8. I mean, maybe it drops back to f8 straight away. But after h5, white definitely has slightly the better of things here. He's got the possibility of attacking the black king. Whereas counterplay for black is, is hard to see, even if black, for instance, doubles rooks on the d-file. I mean, he, actually, he can actually do this later in the game. As Tetraf plays now a very good move, queen e4. That queen's going to swing across to g4. She's not going to stay on e4 for very long. And then the attack starts immediately with threats of bishop h6. So black plays rook d7, h4. Um, again, I don't think white can just bash black flat with queen g4, bishop h6. He needs reserves. So h4, the pawn could be used as a battering ram. They come up to h6 uh, to soften up the black king. And white has the traditional knight h2 available. So two things with one move. And actually in the game, white manages to use h4 in a third way, uh, which we will quickly see. Well, I don't like Backing's next move, knight a5, but I think he's running out of counterplay. I mean, he can play an optically nice move like rook a d8. You know, that's uh, the sort of move which uh, looks nice, but what does it actually do? Um... I suppose white would just continue on the king side, maybe with a move like uh, h5 or knight h2 or bishop g5. In each case, white has the edge because black lacks concrete counterplay. That is the problem. But knight a5, yeah, I don't like it. It's the same type of move that Mirak Murison played against Fisher and regretted. I mean, he never got to use his queen side pieces. That knight on a5 struggles to get into the game here. Well, there are some cheapos, so the queen steps aside. And now seeing bishop h6 coming up, black also steps aside with king h8. And now white manages to make that third use of the h2 square. He plays king h2. This is a slightly enigmatic looking move. Uh, but um, the king is slightly safer on h2 than it is on g1. And I think later on, white is perhaps intending to put a rook on h1. I mean, you can imagine a scenario where black plays g6, white plays h5, lever opens the h file. And then he can play rook h1 at the right moment. Well, when white plays king h2, he's saying, OK, I can do without the services of this knight for the time being. Or at least the knight's going to come to e3 when I need it. So, a, a different twist. Anyway, bishop a, a6, um, he's trying to justify that move knight a5. He's supporting knight c4. He's also thinking of plonking that bishop on d3 to defend the king side. I think this is a more uh, serious... Uh, um, serious defensive idea than uh, than a support of knight c4. Queen h5 was played, g6 protecting f7, and now having provoked that weakness, queen g4 was played. Once g6 has been played, attacking ideas really start to uh, show themselves. h5 followed by rook h1 at some moment is a serious idea. Bishop g5 is now a serious idea because black has... Uh, Pretty uh, pretty chronic dark square weaknesses around his king. And again, we, we always struggling to see black's counterplay. He tries bishop d3, hoping to defend the king side. But white now starts to create concrete threats with knight g5. Which he turns into good account with the crushing move here. Knight takes f7. I'm absolutely convinced that's a move black missed. And the simple point is that after rook takes, queen takes e6. The knight on d5 is pinned. Well, black is in a real mess. He tried rook e7. Well, I suppose rook takes f2 was available. Um, but black's position is not nice even after that. Rook e7 was played. Queen takes d5, rook d8. Queen f3, rook takes e5. And now it was all very simple. Bishop g5. The rooks came off, and the problem is now for black that the rook on d8 is overloaded. He can't protect two bishops at the same time, and uh, it really is a very simple win for white from here. So, rather than play this on, back in resigned. Now, I'm not saying this is the full story on the counter Fianchello variation, but it does give you an indication of the way white should play. 
in general, if we go back to the position after knight c6, White should be thinking about flexibility here. Because that's what Black's thinking of as well. White should be ready for casting by Black on either side. So c3, I think, is the best way. If queen c7, then as we saw, I think knight f1 is again the best move. By these means, White keeps all options open and retains the edge. I've mentioned more than once on this DVD that um, if White is prepared to adopt a King's Indian attack stance in the opening, then he must not be found guilty of stereotypical play. And uh, another one of these variations coming from the French, where White plays for knight gf3, is knight c6. And um, this is a rather unusual move, but it's quite well motivated. Black prepares both bishop c5 and possibly to take the centre with e5. It might seem like a, a waste of a tempo to uh, play e6 and then e5, but White isn't exactly setting the house on fire with his play um, anyway. You know, it takes some time for the King's Indian attack formation to take shape. So... This is one of those instances, I think, where White has got to change tack. He can't just, well, he can just go on with a move like g3, but it's not especially good. Um, for instance, Black can already think about moves like bishop c5, followed by taking on e4. This leads, in general, to a very satisfactory position for Black, and is exactly the type of thing that he's aiming for. So White intercepts this plan with the accurate move c3. However, this is obviously going to lead to a totally different type of position to the normal one, because we're probably not going to put our bishop on g2 at all. So please note this variation. It's very important for White not to just go mechanically on with the same old moves. He doesn't end up with a very good position. So this brings me to the game uh, Alexander Arishchenko, who's graded 2673, a very strong grandmaster. And he's playing Rishagov who's graded 2515. So both very strong players, and this game comes from the Moscow Open in 2009. And it hints at an approach for White, which I think could be quite successful. Now the first point to note about c3 is that uh, it's put the brakes to an extent on the move bishop c5. Because I suppose after that, the bishop could be attacked by b4. So Black decides to play... Um, most common move in this position, a5, trying to secure the c5 square for his bishop. White plays bishop e2, and I suppose black doesn't play bishop to c5 now, because he might be afraid of a move like e5. I don't think bishop takes f2 check uh, leads to very much in this position. Knight to g4 check, king g1, um, knight to e3, and I think white can play queen a4 in this position. So, going back, and aware of the fact that bishop on c5 might become a target, black plays bishop e7. White castles, black castles, and now white plays queen c2, black plays e5, and now rook e1. So the question is, what can white hope for from this basically Philidor's defence in reverse? I mean, it looks like a very passive type of formation for white. The first problem, I think how to develop the queen side pieces. Well, rook e8, and now white plays b3, and now a3. Again, this look, looks like a chronically slow way of playing, but in fact, anybody who plays the Philidor defence with black will know that this has been one of the most successful formations for black in recent times, and so white basically copies it here with an extra move. The extra move in a position of this type isn't really of a great deal of significance because it's a slow position. You would think black had easy equality in this position with free play for his pieces, but I just ask you to consider what happens in this game. Well, b3 afforded white the possibility of playing bishop b2, which uh, Arishchenko takes. Now comes bishop f1, and uh, we note the strong pointing of the e4 pawn, which is typical Philidor with defence positions, whether they're played with white or black. White, uh, black centralises his pieces very easily and now a very thematic move b4, I guess in this setup once you play c3 you should always be looking to play b4 gaining space on the queen side 
And um, I think White's trying to undermine the support of the E5 pawn. That is Black's problem in this position. He might get B5 coming in and then suddenly the E5 pawn's weak. Black opens up a file on the queen side. And White recaptures with his C pawn. Interesting capture that. Opening up the bishop against E5. So Black blocks with D4. All very logical so far. White completes development with rook a c1. Now I'm not exactly sure what this position looks like. It looks like some sort of strange Sicilian in reverse. Um, my impression is that black should be okay, but he's got to be aware of the fact that his pawns in the center can become exposed in this position. And with rook c1, uh, well, white's always, already created a, a, a definite threat. He's threatening b5, and then the c7 pawn will fall, which is why Rich Shagoff plays rook c8. White nudges the bishop. Bishop drops away. Well, of course, he can take on uh, f3. But uh, knight takes is comfortable for white. If he goes bishop e6, we go knight g5. So now comes knight h4. Now, the typical idea, and white's definitely thinking about not only monitoring the f5 square, but occupying it at a later date. Knight a7 was played. And white plays his queen to b3. Now the light square bishop from black is drifting offside. White feels justified in putting his queen on this powerful diagonal. Controlling a lot of important squares. And black plays c5. So black is making sense of his pieces in a very logical way. White captures. Black recaptures. And now both sides put their rooks on the c-file. a4. Gaining a little bit of space, stopping uh, any thought of b5 or possibly knight b5 a little later on. And I think the most important point of this move is that it secures the c4 square for the knight. Which white duly obliges by playing on the next move. Alright, queen c7. And now a very interesting move, <coughs> which uh, again hints at the idea that black centre is not quite as secure as it looks. The destabilising f4. And it's around here that white starts to develop a serious advantage. He's done it by quiet means as well. And almost surreptitiously. Pushing the bishop offside, you can see what an effect that's had on the position. The white queen is actually quite dominant on the long diagonal there, down to f7. Moreover, the bishop on h5 is now in, well, definite danger of being trapped as is proven after knight d7, when white cold-bloodedly goes through with g4. Now, if we go back to f4, obviously black can take this pawn. But then bishop takes d4, and white's central pawns could become very strong. Obviously, black didn't like this possibility. But knight d7, is he bluffing white? Is he saying, well, play g4, I'm going to play, he takes f4, sack a piece, and open up your king. Well, Arischenko, in the modern style, you know, if you analyse long enough with Fritz and friends, you'll know that taking material is often a very good idea. In the old days, taking material was sometimes thought risky. Computers have taught us that sometimes it's the most effective way to win a game, just to take everything on offer. And brave, well, what looks like a very powerful attack from Black here, and just defend it out. Well, Queen A2 was played. We're looking for the Black Queen to make... Um, to make an entry, queen f4, that forces the white knight to find the square f5, and now black plays f2. You see, the problem for black in this position is only attacking with the queen and pawn. There's no follow-up. So this gives white the chance to play the very comfortable move here. Bishop takes d4, and now black's already getting desperate. He can't polish white off by brutal means alone. He's got to add fuel to the flames. Knight takes d3 was answered by bishop takes d3. And queen f3 by king h2. Queen takes d3. And now white hits black on the rebound. Rook takes f2. Rook takes c4. Now the beautiful move here. Knight h6 check. I'm not sure what black could have done about that. Whether he overlooked it or not. Uh, he's certainly got to take that uh, knight. Otherwise knight takes f7. is just going to be ruinous. So he takes rook g1 check. And now you can see black is caught totally on the rebound. 
and White finishes with the splendid move Bishop F6. No need for any heroics here whatsoever. Put the Bishop in on F6. Backs a piece down. He hardly got a check in, in anger in this position. Actually, not, Black's not a piece down. It, 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 I just know he's the knight on a7. To all intents and purposes, he's a piece down with no defence against the uh, the uh, white attack. So going back to our opening uh, moves, let's consider this move knight c6 again. Watch out for this move. It's going to be common, and um, it's a variation on the line we looked at earlier where Black played bishop c5. Black's planning that move, the best way to meet it is not to mechanically go on with the kings in an attack with g3. Play c3 first. I think that's the right way to play. And, um, well, you could do worse than follow Arischenko's splendid example in our featured game. I'm going to show you another game now, which concludes my treatment of the kings in an attack against the French, um, which deviates from the normal kings in an attack. The thing is, White's playing quite slowly in the opening with these moves d3 and then knight d2. So this obviously gives Black a wide choice of responses. And in the game, Alexander Strapansky, strong grandmaster, versus B. Grand Zhao, played in the New York Full Futurity Open in 2001, Black decided to play what looks like at first sight a very peculiar idea, taking on e4 and playing e5, but which in fact is actually quite logical. We've transposed back into a kind of open game where the knight on d2 is not ideally placed. Well, that's what black is hoping to prove. However, you know, I do think white, by modest means, can work up some sort of small edge here. And Stupanski starts in the right way by playing his knight to f3, um, attacking the pawn on e5. Now, in open games, speedy development is of the essence, and pointed development at that. So, in order to get anything to extract anything out of this position, White's got to continue with threats. And thus, Bishop b5 sets up ideas of taking that pawn on e5 again. Thus, Black is more or less obliged to put his bishop on a passive square. I mean, he'd much rather play that bishop to c5, but then he would always have to worry about the e5 pawn. So, by these pointed means, Stupanski is pushing Black into uh, a passive position. Black plays queen e7, once again reinforcing the e5 pawn. There's nothing wrong with black's game, don't get me wrong, but it is a little bit passive. I prefer white. Queen comes to e2, bishop d7, and now once again a move which um, creates a threat. In the open game, threats are of um, great importance because they give you more time to develop the initiative. I don't think black wants to play f6 in this position, although obviously he can if he wishes. Instead, Zhao decided to develop a piece. And now White played knight e3. Again, continuing to hammer away with threats. Certainly knight d5 is an idea, and knight f5 is the backup move. h6. Well, Zhao's getting a bit uncomfortable. He's beginning to wonder how he got him into this mess in the first place by playing the most natural moves. Well, the reason he got into this mess, of course, is that his opening choice, d takes e4 and then e5, costs a little bit of time. And Stupanski, by accurate, aggressive moves, is taking advantage of that slight loss of time. It's not at all easy to play in this way with white, because you've got to be really accurate. You've got to play moves which create threats all the time, and which force the enemy passive. Not at all easy, it's a great skill. So the way Stupanski has played this opening is very skillful indeed. And now he's starting to work up a very nice edge, after bishop takes f6, g takes f6. Well, black will argue he's got two bishops. And this is a counterbalancing factor. He's also got the open g file. Next to double pawns, there always, or more often than not, comes an open file. So black takes that file, hammering away at g2. And white plays knight h4, protecting the pawn. But that's also a constructive move. It's not only defensive, because white's thinking about playing knight f5. Rook g4 was answered by g3, and now black tries to break out with f5. Well, white is in the castle on the queen side, so uh, black feels some sort of action is necessary. And let's just take a look at this. The pawn is pinned against the unprotected bishop on a4. So white has to pause for a second 
and play f3. Rook g5, and only now does white take on f5. Bishop takes f5, e takes f5, rook takes f5. And now I'm going to set you a small challenge. I'm not going to ask you to guess black's next move. Try to do this before we go on. I know black has just moved. I told you it was tricky. Well, believe it or not, black actually resigned this position. Now, I must admit, when I first saw this, I had to do a double take. He's played rook takes f5, then he resigns. What's going on? Well, on closer inspection, black actually has some serious problems. His main problem is, how the heck does he extricate his rook from the mess it's got itself into on f5? That rook is very short of squares. So, for instance, if white just continues with castle on the queen side here, he's threatening to round up that rook very simply by going h4 and then g4. The rook's got no squares. It's a rather remarkable situation. So in order to extricate that rook after castles, black would have to play a move like rook g5. And he obviously didn't like it uh, after f4. Again, black has been forced to waste time. In this case, to retrieve his rook from a precarious position on f5. And now he's just getting into trouble. Zhao obviously didn't like this position, and he felt it was more respectful to resign against the Grandmaster. Well, let's just see why Black is in such a mess. I mean, the, the clear reason is, he's king stuck in the middle. So, for instance, he could go rook g8 in this position if he wants. Then we take on e5. Queen g5, check. Black recaptures. Knight f6, check. Does the job. Going back to the position after f4. Well, Black can try rook g7. And then comes queen h5. Basically, black is really struggling here because he's got his king stuck in the middle. And whether he plays e takes f4 or not, white can obviously take advantage of the black king in the middle with splendid moves, such as bishop takes c2, and now the complete crusher. Knight takes c7 check. Obviously, if bishop takes c7, we've got queen takes c6 check. Other than that, black is going material behind. So, going back to the final position in the game, um, it's a bit of a deceptive one. But of course, Black got into this mess because he wasted time twice in this game. The first was in the opening where he took on e4 and played e5. Um, the second one was not so obvious where he put his rook on, on a, uh, a slightly, how can I put it, exposed square. But Stropanski played very well in this game, very well indeed. Very accurate play all the way through. And I think he deserved to win. In conclusion, against the French setup, you can't really play the Kings in an attack, and it's absolutely everything. For the most part, when Black plays in traditional French manner with c5, then the Kings in an attack is appropriate. But there are other setups of Black that don't involve the move c5, where maybe another approach by White is better. So do bear this in mind. I mentioned up front um, just how selective you've got to be when employing the Kings in an attack. I don't think it's particularly effective against every conceivable opening. I mean, you read some opening textbooks, it's almost as if the Kings in an attack is some universal answer to White's problems. You know, you can play it against every single thing and, and get some sort of an advantage. I'm afraid that's just not true. And um, one of the least effective guises of the Kings in an attack is against the Karo Khan, in my view. Now, there have been many strong grandmasters who have um, use the Kings in an attack against the Karo with success. One of the most notable ones was, of course, Leonid Stein. Uh, he played some marvellous games with White um, in, in this system. But in general, Black has a pretty easy time of it in the Karo can. And the main reason, I think, is because he can play E5 in one go. And um, this opportunity to free up his game is quite often taken and gives Black a, a really a really trouble-free opening. Now, I'm going to show you again to highlight what I mean for Warned is Forearmed um, when we come to play in this opening. This game comes from the Spanish Team Championship played in May 2010 between uh, Andres uh, Gallardo Garcia, who's obviously an international master sound, he's 2412, and he's playing Alvar Alonso Roselli, who's graded 2509. And in this particular game, uh, Black just proceeds unhurriedly through the opening and takes his opportunity to play e5. 
This is the absolute main line, I would say, of the Kingsley attack versus the Karakan. Both sides castle now White has to decide on a plan. I mean, Black has an absolutely free run of it here. He's got the centre. Um, he's got no problem developing his pieces, I would say. So White has to find a good plan and to make a move, really, um, which is the introduction to a plan which, which somehow disrupts Black's thinking. And Stein came up with this move B4, which is exactly the game Gallardo Garcia plays here. The point of B4 is not immediately obvious, but um, what White intends to do is to play his bishop to B2 to put pressure on the E5 pawn. Obviously, the E5 pawn is a possible target for White. Uh, White could connect bishop B2 with moves like rook E1. He could connect it with moves like D4. So B4 is not really a space-gaining move on the queen side, although it can be used like that. It's more to create a square for the bishop. And Black does best to challenge this, this plan straight away with A5. I think A5 is a good move. I think it more or less forces White to take on A5. And after Queen takes A5, Black is getting his pieces, his pieces out. Of course, he's still got to worry about the fate of the E5 pawn. So uh, Gallardo Garcia played Bishop B2. But Black can easily cover that with Knight D7. I'm not sure I see the opportunity to create too many problems for Black in a position of this type. I think the biggest difficulty I have with White's position is that actually by playing b4 he's fragmented his queenside pawn structure. So actually these pawns on the queenside are potentially quite weak. So Alonso uh, Rosselli continues to play good moves. He plays d4, throttling the bishop on, um, on b2. And now with that move, Black announces I think he's going to go to town on the queen side. I mean, one interesting manoeuvre for, for Black here would be to play his knight to a4. That's a little bit embarrassing for the bishop should the knight ever reach that square. And c3 is weak. So White decided to break that grip on the c3 square by playing knight b3 and c3. Again, I think this is the right plan. But as you'll see in the game, Black is able once again quite comfortably, comfortably to meet it by taking on c3 and playing c5. Again, it's the pawn structure which is going to give White a headache in this game. White's got a pawn on d3, backward on an open file, and I think the same applies to the a2 pawn. Meanwhile, Black um, has a nice grip on d4, and everything's going to hinge on whether this pawn on c5 is a strength or a weakness. But certainly White trains his sights on that pawn in the upcoming play. He plays rook fc1, Knight c6 is very sensible, and now a4. And the point of a4 is that, uh, well, actually, white is expecting black to play b6. Black does it straight away. Therefore, white moves out of the way. Now, I think white's thinking of cracking open black's position by playing a5, exchanging his weakness for um, at the pawn at b6, and then hopefully he can take on c5 in peace. So black continues to attack with bishop a6. A5 is all very logical, and there are some exchanges on the A5 square, conveniently, for both players. And now comes rook fb8. And one of the problems for white now is that he can't take on c5 with the knight, because his rook on a5 is hanging. Therefore he's got to temporise with knight fd2, and now black plays bishop h6. So if we're thinking in terms of the king's ended attack, well there hasn't been any attack. Again, white has had to... Because of the passive location of the bishop on g2, he's had to reorganise his game. He's had to play the position in a completely different way to normal. And, um, well, I like Black's bishop pair in this position. Despite the fact that uh, White doubles on the bishop on a6, and Black gives up the bishop pair with bishop takes d2. Well, um, this is an interesting move, and I think the point of it is that uh, if, if White takes back with the knight in this position then I think black can play bishop takes d3. And that uncovers a double attack on the rook at a5. So white must take back with the queen. And now again, black plays very sensibly here. He plays c4. I mean, obviously he can go rook takes b3. But that just makes life a little bit too easy for white after rook takes a6. Pieces come off the board. Yes, black has a slight advantage in this position, but he gets a similar sort of situation in the game. Um, with interest, I would say. C4 puts the pressure on, it liquidates a potential weakness, and it gives black, well, what could be a very strong passed pawn. 
Of course, Black's got the problem of resolving the pin on the bishop at a6, but he does this elegantly enough with the tactical move rook b1. Rook takes b1, queen takes a5, knight e2, and now knight c5. Knight takes c3, bishop takes d3. All the way through this small sequence, what Black is re re retaining control of the position. And as you can see, the bishop on g2 hasn't fired a shot in anger in this game just yet. So rook c1, knight b3, very good. Rook d1, queen takes c3, queen takes d3. And now Black continued with a tactical sequence when he played rook a1. Off came the rooks, bishop f1. And you might be forgiven for thinking that Black hasn't got enough firepower to win this position. But the problem for White is, A, he has no counterplay, and B, the knight is potentially a much stronger piece than White's bishop. A point which Black emphasises by putting his knight on the very strong square, D4. Now, it looks as though it should be a piece of cake to hold this. But the fact is, the knight towers over the bishop when play um, is restricted to one side of the board. That's exactly what happens here. Um, White tries to get some counterplay, tries to get his bishop going, but uh, Black is in control all the way through, and in the end manages to whip up an attack, as one often does with the Queen and Knight in tandem. So G5, I mean perhaps White shouldn't have played H4, but uh, he was kind of running out of things to do. He tries to find a square for the bishop on H3. Queen comes to E1, another good move, hitting the pawn on F2. Uh, white protects, and now black goes in with knight e2. This is very awkward for white. Queen g1 check, whilst not mate, is very dangerous for the future health of white's king. As we'll see in the game, when white played queen e3, the king was driven out up to g4, and now black just played quietly with f6. It's almost as if uh, white's been forced to deactivate his bishop, and at the same time, his, his king is now in, in mortal peril. With queen d1, I'm sure, as one of the primary ideas. Probably Black's plan is to somehow get the queen back. Um, so I mean something like queen d1 and then queen up here, queen back here. This would be a rather nice sequence for, for Black. So queen d2 stops it. Queen h1, now Black is threatening queen takes e4 and queen f3. So the queen must go back. In the end, black couldn't stop the check. And now black manages to bring his queen back into the action, driving the king even further up the board. And once you've got the king up there, you're not going to win him off. King h7 completes a well-played game with, of course, knight g7 high on the agenda. So that was an uncomfortable experience for white throughout. And uh, it's really symptomatic of the lack of play White gets against the Karo Khan using the Kings in an attack. So, as I've said before on this DVD, you, you've got to show a sense of discretion when you play this opening. Against the French, certainly. Against the Sicilian, definitely. Against the Karo Khan, no. Now, the Kings in an attack may be used successfully against the Sicilian. It's perhaps at its most effective in lines where black plays e6, but it need not be restricted for use solely against this variation. One of the um, main things I like about the Kings in the attack against the Sicilian is that you don't have to develop that knight on b1 to d2 early. You can often leave it at home, and this gives you additional possibilities. As we'll see in our very first game, which comes from the Canadian Closed Championship in 2001, between Grandmaster Kevin Spraggett and Mark Blustein, whose grade is 2303. All Black does in this game is to trot down um, what he thinks is the main line of the close Sicilian. I mean, I think a lot of your opponents are going to play in this manner. The uh, setup with e6 and knight g e7 is very flexible and adaptable. But White deviates from the normal procedure here by playing c3. I think this is a good move. I think. Uh, White is certainly threatening to take the centre at some point with d4. And this is a, a little bit worrying for black in that, um, well, if white gets to play d4 free of charge, why not? In addition, white can simply uh, switch plans. He could play rook e1 and continue in the, the normal fashion. So black tries to interrupt white's plan straight away by playing d5. 
and now the queen comes to e2. Well now, the thing is, if black castles early in this variation, he often finds himself under fire. White proceeds with e5, and then attacks in the usual manner. In general, when you're playing white against this particular setup, it's best to wait until black castles before playing e5, all other things being equal. So that's why in this game, black kind of hedges his bets by playing h6, and white plays h4, whereupon black plays b6. And now white's got to make a decision. I think black perhaps intends to put his bishop on a6, possibly queen d7 is coming, and then who knows, black may even castle long. So Spaggett plays e5. Now this is an interesting moment in the game. Is the pawn on e5 strong or weak? Well I don't see black surrounding that pawn um, in the near future. For instance if black plays queen c7 in this position, white will simply play uh, his rook to e1. That's safe enough. I think the queen on c7 is slightly misplaced. And now here white may show the individuality of this line by playing his knight to a3, which in turn threatens knight b5. White may or may not play a4 before that manoeuvre. So after e5, black plays a5, gaining some space on the queen side, and then puts his bishop on a6. But the net effect of a5 has been to create a hole on b5, which white tries to take advantage of with knight a3. It's also quite unattractive for black now to cast on the queen side because he's made so many pawn advances in that sector. So Blufstein bites the bullet and castles. So what type of attacking chances does white have in a position of this type? Well, pretty good. As Spraggett frees up the queen by playing rook e1, black plays rook a7, another one of those flexible moves. We don't quite know what role the rook is going to play, but it will certainly play some role, perhaps a defensive role on the 7th rank. But anyway, white is not bothered by that move. He just puts his bishop out on f4, and play proceeds in the usual manner. Queen rook comes to d7, queen comes to d2, and um, around here black is starting to feel a little bit uncomfortable. Now, he could obviously play king h7. That's, um, I think, what can I call it? The normal move here. Excuse me, slip of the mouse. Yeah, king h7. Possibly after that, white would continue with uh, knight h2. With the idea of knight g4, further intensifying the pressure against h6. If black continued to defend doggedly with a move like knight g8, well then, his position is becoming rather passive. And if he plays h5 in a position of this type, well white can just simply reroute his knight back to f3 and then into g5. Black's a bit worse in this position because he's got two weak squares to guard. One very close to his king. So Blufstein, going back to queen d2, hits out with d4. Closing the queen side, because if we just go back, bishop takes h6 will now be answered by uh, d takes c3, when d3 falls. So c4 blocking, and now knight f5 is his defensive idea. He's defending h6 with that knight. Spraggett is quite happy to play g4 in this position. And now knight f e7. Well, I'm sure what, when Blufstein played this move, knight f5, he forgot that after knight takes h4, knight takes h4, the knight on c6 is loose. There's not enough compensation for black after queen takes h4, bishop takes c6, queen takes g4, check, bishop g3. Black is simply a piece down in this position. So going back, unfortunately for Blufstein, knight fe7 had to be played to keep that knight on c6 protected, and now white takes on h6 free of charge. So knight b4 was played, and now it's fairly plain sailing for Spraggett. He gets all the advantages of the kings in an attack. The bridgehead at e5, with an extra pawn to boot. The dark square weaknesses around the king. It's easy for white to shunt in the pieces now. And that's exactly what Spraggett does. Blufstein makes a rather feeble attempt to defend f7. Queen g3 protecting. 
F4, the kingside pawn storm, begins. King drops out of the way. King F2. And with a total absence of counterplay to be seen for black, Blushstein decided to resign. I mean, he's a pawn down against a really strong grandmaster, and he's got no counterplay whatsoever. I suppose white could just steamroll the black on the king side with moves such as rook h1 and then h5. It really isn't difficult. So yes, black did blunder in that game. I mean, if we go back to the position after uh, queen d2, it's fairly obvious he's got to play a better move than d4. But uh, king h7, knight h2 looks better for white to me. Probing the black king side. Following on from the last game, we come to the game Lubojevic versus Timon, played in Hilversum in 1973. This is an old game, but it certainly is very relevant to our topic. Lubojevic came out with the king's Indian attack, and black played e6. Knight f3 was answered by knight c6, and then white played g3, g6, bishop g2. Again in this game, we see the characteristic plan for white of leaving the b1 knight at home for the time being. So black played knight e7, white played this nice move c3, and now Timon, rather carelessly I would say, castles. What should black do? Well, he, he could play d5, as the, the last game um, showed, or perhaps even e5 is a possibility here. Castles, funnily enough, is a small error and just allows White to take the centre straight away. So it will certainly be instructive for our investigation to see what happens when White takes the centre in this manner. As you would think that after, for instance, C takes D4, C takes D4 and D5, Black might be able to make this pawn on D4 a target. Well, White went E5. And this is a rather favourable version of the Kings in an attack in that White has managed to establish a very strong pawn wedge in the centre which is cramping the style of the bishop on g7. Obviously black can play f6, but then his pawn at e6 is weak. So Timon decided to play knight f5, preparing to play f6 on the next move. White brought his knight out to c3. Another benefit, of course, of uh, leaving the knight on b1 at home is that sometimes you will be able to get the knight out to c3, which is, of course, a much more active square than d2. And now black tries to challenge the white centre by playing f6. Alright, rook e1. Lubojevic is unwilling to cede the e5 point. Timon takes, and then just gets his bishop out with bishop d7. And white plays bishop f4. So the opening has ended in, um, I would say, a certain victory for white. White's minor pieces are all very centrally directed, and the white position is harmonious. Black's bishop, meanwhile... Both of the black bishops are rather cramped and lack activity. So Timon tries to destabilise white by playing h6 and white plays h4. Quite important for white to um, cement the position of that bishop on f4. Meanwhile, bishop comes to e8. Well, um, again, that does look a very passive move. But I think black wants to activate his queen. If black had played queen b6 immediately, which I think, well, that, if it can be played, is a better move than um, bishop e8. Unfortunately, that runs now into knight takes d5, which looks like a pretty strong idea to me. If he takes d5, queen takes d5, check rook f7, white plays e6. So bishop e8 uh, preparing queen b6, white goes queen d2. And Timon played queen b6 anyway, whereupon Lubojevic brought all his pieces into the game with rook a d1. That pawn on e5 is really exerting uh, an unpleasant influence on black's position. It's really cramping his style. All right, Timon played rook d8. And the question is, where to go from here? I mean, I imagine it's a question which will confront many of you during your chess career. I've got a nice position. What am I going to do with it? All right, well, Lubojevic decides to hassle the black queen with knight a4. Good move, eyeing the c5 square. And beyond c5 lies the juicy target on e6. Queen 
moves up to attack the knight, and white just plays b3, protecting, whereupon Timon takes a little time out to safety his king a bit more with king h7. Then comes bishop f1. And this is again quite unpleasant for back because he's got to offer the exchange of queens here, and the problem with that is that the upcoming late middle game stroke early end game position after knight c5 is very favourable to white. Because as you can see, white's already really putting the heat on black's pawns. Well, black can't let e6 go, so he played bishop to f7, and now comes a3. And I think this move is, well, more or less decisive, as far as I can see. It drives the knight out of play. The problem with this position from black's perspective is that if he goes knight c2, we go rook e2, knight takes, knight takes a3, and now rook a2 is actually winning that knight. So going back to uh, a3, black has got to find something else. I mean, if he goes, for instance, knight c6 in this position, knight takes b7, rook b8, hoping to get a bit of counterplay, well, then I think white can simply go bishop a6, followed by b4. So going back to the game now, after a3, this is why Timon played b6. Okay, this is not ideal though, because uh, white could win a pawn. He took on b4, black took on c5, and this is going to be a winning pawn, I think. Strong pass pawn. Black comes over to b8 to try and hit the queenside pawns. White plays rook b1, and black played a5. Well, of course, Timon now is playing a pawn down. And Lubojevic at that time, back in 1973, was an incredibly strong player. I mean, he was one of the best players in the world. So, White really does have a technically one position, or at least he should do. Well, after a5, there came bishop d2. Black activated his rook on f8. And White just protected that pawn. White understands that as long as that pawn on c5 remains on the board, Black has very serious difficulties here. In fact, probably Black is lost. Timon tried g5, for reasons best known unto himself, although it has to be said, Black is running out of counterplay in this position, with White ready to play c6, and then maybe even take off the a pawn. So g5 was played, White went bishop d3, Black went g4, and White put his knight on d4, after which Black played bishop to g6. Knight captured on f5. Why not exchange pieces? There was a double exchange on f5. And now White took on a5. The two passed pawns, one senses, are going to have their say. And after b4, there was no doubt about the fact that Black was lost. OK, he can maybe erect a temporary blockade on the light squares. Um, but uh, it's unlikely that this will be permanent. White's rook is now freed up, enticing the pawn to come forward, and after king f1, black's position has suddenly become a lot worse because that pawn on d4 is really interfering with his bishop. Rook went to e8 to dissuade the white king from coming out. Rook comes to e1. Black played his rook to e7, getting out of the pin, and now Lubojevic played rook bd1, threatening rook takes d4. Hence, king g6, but this is no solution. There was a capture on d4, a capture on e7, black played king f6, and now white played his bishop into d8. A rather elegant way of forcing resignation. Black will have to move his king again, and then, well, white c pawn is going to march all the way up the board. So a pretty good game there by Lubojevic. And uh, it just goes to show you that black can't play standard moves or automatic moves in this system. After c3, he's really got to think independently and uh, come up with a good plan. Castles, as Timon played, allowing white to play d4, seems rather careless. My final game on this DVD features the Botvinnik system. A line of the close Sicilian for black, where black plays with d6. And e5. It's a game from the Liechtenstein Open in 2009 between Karel van der Wieder, uh, a very strong Dutch player who's grades 2497 
and Alexander Reichmann, whose grade at the time was nearly 2300. And um, as you can see, Black is playing d6 with every intention of getting into his favourite variation, the Nidorf or the Dragon, or perhaps even the Skeven Engine. But White frustrates this uh, ambition by playing the Calm d3. Now, once again, this is not an approach that's going to set the house on fire, but um, what we're going to have here is a pretty solid version of the Close Sicilian from White's point of view. Uh, it's a hybrid, really, of the King's Indian attack and the Close Sicilian. Um, normally, White keeps his knight on um, g1 in the Close Sicilian to be able to play f4 quickly, but here White adopts a different approach. Note once again, Van der Weide has delayed the entry of the knight on b1 into the game. And after e5, he plays c3. So, um, once again, it's it's a question of being adaptable when you play the Kings in an attack. And White is showing his adaptability in this case. Well, the system that Black's adopting is definitely quite attractive. Black develops his knight to e7, and then after due preparation, he hopes to be able to start a kingside attack with f5. White must be aware that if he's got a knight on f3 in this position then this plan could be dangerous for him. So van der Weide decides to start counterplay against the black pawn chain by playing a3 and then b4, trying to chip away at the black pawns. And black played a typical move in this system, h6. The point of this is to prepare the move bishop e6 without allowing white the option of the annoying knight g5. h6 also takes away g5, from a white bishop. Knight bd2. Okay, well, having come this far, it's difficult to see an alternative location for the knight. Um, one attractive route for this knight might be to come up to c4, back to e3, and then hopefully to get in on d5 at the right moment, although that's a long way off. Black thinks that white is playing very slowly, and so he breaks with f5 straight away. I mean, I think perhaps bishop e6 will be slightly more patient um, in this position. But f5 was played. White took. Black recaptured with the pawn. And now white played queen b3 check. King h7. And now bishop b2. An interesting positioning of the bishop um, in this line. Um, I think... Well, it's hard to see how White is going to make this bishop work for him. But at some point, I think White is planning on opening the long diagonal. You'll see how this mechanism comes into operation in a moment. As after b6, White went knight h4. Black takes the centre with d5. And now White plays f4. And already, there's a softening up of the long diagonal. In time, the bishop on b2 could become a very strong piece. Now, whilst Black's position looks good, it's actually rather loose. Black hasn't really developed his queenside properly yet, so he's going into action possibly slightly too early in this game. Black plays e4, and then White had no hesitation in sacrificing a piece here to open up the Black King by taking on e4 twice. So for the piece, White's got two pawns and a very violent attack. He's also winning time. Rook AD1 gains extra time. It introduces a, another piece into the fray. Black must move his queen. And now F5 restrains the action of the bishop on C8. And, um, well, threatens to take a can over to the black king with a move like F6, which will be carefully prepared before execution. So Rook B8, getting the rook off the long diagonal. B5, Knight E5, and now C4. So almost miraculously in this game, the dark square bishop has come to life. Bishop b7 was answered by rook d e1. So this piece sacrifice is actually very clever. Um, the problem with black's position is he can't get his pieces coordinated. And um, he's struggling here against the advancing white pawns. There's also pressure on the long diagonal. Pressure against e5. Pressure beyond against g7. And a definite chance of occupation of the g6 square in due course. So black has some problems I would say. And he got his king off the long diagonal by playing king g8. Now when I first looked at this position I thought well how about queen d6 here? 
and the point of that is to get the queen in on d3 to try and exchange some pieces. Well, analysing with deep fritz, it turns out that rook f4 is actually a very strong move in this position. White's threatening perhaps rook d e4, rook f e4, excuse me, putting extra pressure on the knight. So, if queen d3, Fritz suggested the very remarkable queen a2, and if queen d2, we have rook takes e5. This is a good example of how the pressure can mount against the black king. Black has very serious, if not impossible, problems to solve on the dark squares. So, Reichmann evacuates with king g8. White hoovers off the bishop on b7 and then plays queen e3. This is quite a, an embarrassing move for black. He tries knight f3 check, in the hope that by acquiring the dark square bishop the pressure will be lifted. In comes the white queen, and then in comes the white knight. This is extremely dangerous now for black. The immediate threat is of course, knight takes e7 or queen takes e7 check. So black takes it, the queen comes in, the queen gets another pawn, king must come to g8 to protect the rook, and now f6, cutting communication in the black camp. The bishop on b2 is now right out of the game. Queen comes across to h7, queen g5, check, we don't want the queens off just yet, and rook e7. Again, forces black's hand to force him to make a move he desperately doesn't want to make. The Excelsior theme now comes to mind with White's pawn getting ever closer to promotion. So Black tries a few checks. I mean, I don't think he's got much else to play here. The king comes to h3. And after queen h7 check, just queen h4 does the job remarkably. What can Black play? He moves his rook to e8. White has rook f8 check. If he takes the queen, as happened in the game, king captures and now black has no useful move. Therefore, in this position, Rayman resigned. This brings us to the end of um, our introductory examination of the King's Indian attack. I hope I've shown that it's not an opening which can or should be played against everything, but against the right variations it can work very well. It provides you with a standard plan and a clear plan of campaign in most cases. But beware, you do have to vary your play on occasion, as black has lots of choices too. White's initial opening move sequence is rather slow. Finally, summing up, I think the average club player could do a lot worse than to venture the Kings in an attack, or at least incorporate it into his or her repertoire. It could become a very good point scorer for you. Well, that's it for now, and I sincerely hope you enjoyed this all new Foxy Openings DVD. Until we meet again, the very best of luck.